Hello, everybody. Hello, YouTube. Hello, art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss Sam, and I'm back with yet another video. So here I am again. I mean, like, yeah, I know. I've been, I've been doing a lot, like, video after video after video lately. Um, my latest one, and that I just put up here, so I'm making two in one evening. This is crazy for me but i'm having fun so just let me have my fun um i i this is not going to be a shining video this time this time i'm like i i open my videos every time i say hello everybody hello youtube hello art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados and like i don't do a whole lot of art history on this channel and i feel guilty about that i mean i did my little hunter biden video what 13 days ago. Good Lord. Now, today I want to do a little something. I want to do a little something that actually is um, art history, or at least art history related. Or, you know, like I said, art, art history enthusiast, visual culture aficionados. Listen, I want to talk about some art. I want to talk about some paintings. So here we are. Okay, here's my home page, right? You know you're in the right place. Going to get the church announcements right out the way. Um, new viewers, Thank you for being new. Returning viewers, thank you for returning subscribers. Thank you so much for subscribing. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share these videos if you know somebody who would be interested in them. Um, I'm happy that whoever's watching, thank you. Just thank you. I appreciate it so very much. And I think that's it. You know, I got that out the way. Um, what am I going to talk about today? This guy. Okay, I really, really, really wanted to, I've always wanted to do a video about like a famous artist or a famous painter, a famous painting, and here he is, all right? You can't get much more famous than this guy, Edward Hopper, um, who, you know, what, what, what painting is he the very most famous for? This one, all right? This one. Uh, the Nighthawks from 1942. So when I, I had the idea to do this video finally about a painter and paintings that everybody would know about, especially or at least if you're um, American, you know about this artist, you know about this painting, you have seen it or a parody of it somewhere on TV, in a movie in a comic or something like that. This thing is freaking iconic. This thing, this, the Nighthawks is freaking iconic. Um, and I wanted to talk about this artist. Why? Because I, for some reason, I like his work. I, and when I say for some reason I like this work, it's something that I can't quite explain. I don't know why I like his work. I don't know why I like this painting a lot. And, and most of his other paintings. For some reason, I just enjoy them. Um, he is Americana. He is one of those artists that is just synonymous with whatever, whatever it is we've got going on in this country, in the United States. He is synonymous. His, his work is, is, I guess, the um, art that somehow, in its own very, very, very special way, uh, gives you just a visual blast uh, to the eyes uh, regarding the American experience and what it is to live in the United States. I know I have a lot of viewers and or listeners who are not American. I know, like, you know, because you've mentioned it in the comments where you're from or whatever, you're not from the United States or you don't live in the United States. Um, and thank you for watching my videos, especially if you're not from here, like the way I talk and my you know, ridiculous Californian, Los Angeles accent, you might think I sound ridiculous. Or maybe you don't even have to be from outside of the United States to think that I sound funny. Uh, maybe you could, I think, who's who's one of my, my commenters who's from, like, New Jersey? I must sound hilarious to you. Um, <laughs> or, or Illinois. Hello, Tankard. Um, you know, this is how we talk here. This is how I talk here. But so especially people who are outside of the United States though like what is that like you must 
I, I know because my parents are immigrants and they're from another country. So I was raised speaking two languages, living in two different cultures, the American culture and the one that my parents come from. And I, I remember them telling stories about when they uh, were thinking about coming to the United States. They thought that the the whole country looked like New York City. Okay, or Hollywood or whatever. And they, when they got here, um, they were kind of uh, unpleasantly surprised, especially my father. He ended up on a farm here in California. Definitely doesn't look like New York on a farm um, <laughs> or a small town in California. Yeah, it has not, doesn't even remotely resemble the bright lights and the and the noise and the hu hu um, hustle and bustle of a big, beautiful, glamorous, tall city. No. And that's why I want to show you Edward Hopper, especially those of you who watch my videos who are not from the United States. He captures the American experience really quite succinctly. Um, and that's what I want you to, you know, know about. If you want to come to this country, please do. You know, please come over here and, and take a look around. And if you want to stay, stay, uh, just like my parents did. But I'm warning you, not everywhere looks like a big, beautiful city. Not everywhere looks like New York City or Miami or Boston or um, Los Angeles. Oh, God help you if you, if you come to Los Angeles and you, you're going to learn how to drive real well. Let me tell you, I spend a lot of time on the freeway. I spend a lot of time on the freeway. And funnily enough, <clears throat> Edward Hopper's art is itself a product of the modern world that was, you know, the modern world as we know it, as we now know, it. even now in the year, I mean, I know it's almost over, but the year 2022, um, this modern world that we now know in 2022, turning into 2023, was shaped or began being shaped, um, in my estimation, in my opinion, in maybe the 1920s, 30s, definitely the 1940s, during the Second World War, yesterday, December 6th was, or maybe the day before yesterday, or so, I don't, whenever you're watching this, it doesn't matter, December 6th was, um, uh, the commemorate the, the what what is the what's the terminology the remembrance of the bombing of pearl harbor so that's definitely that was happening happened in 1941 um and that was the united states's entry into the second world war and the painting that we're that i'm especially interested in 1942 nighthawks by the artist that we're discussing today edward hopper like i said edward hopper is americana especially 20th century modern um, age, industrial age Americana. And you'll see why as I go along. Um, I don't know how long this video is going to be, but I'm going to take as long as I need to take in order to discuss one of my favorite artists. And um, yes, I'm going to use, yeah, look at all these Wikipedia uh, links. Yeah, this is not me being lazy. No. This is me giving you the official version of the story regarding this artist. And I'm going to put all of these links, as I do, as I always do, or usually do, in the description of this video. So Edward Hopper was born in the 19th century. He was born July 22nd, 1882. I guess that would make him a cancer. Uh, May 15th, 1967 was his last day on this on this plane of existence. Uh, he was an American realist painter and printmaker. While he is widely known for his oil paintings, he was equally proficient as a watercolorist and printmaker in etching. Okay, this is interesting to know because most people don't ever think of him as a watercolorist or a printmaker, but he, he obviously was. And if you look around, if you're interested in Edward Hopper or this particular like time period or genre of American art, please look him up. Please Google him. You will see ever so many of his works that are not these like big finished pieces like this one, the Nighthawks. This one, the size of the Nighthawks is here. It says the dimensions underneath uh, 33.1 
inches by 60 inches. 60 inches, y'all. This painting is five feet long. Or wide, rather. Yeah? The width of this thing. That 60 inches is five feet. That's big. That's big. Uh, 152.4 centimeters wide by 84.1 centimeters high. Okay, that's a big painting. Anything like five five feet, like, think about it. Five feet, that's a lot. It's not enormous like an altarpiece or like Guernica by Pablo Picasso, but it's a big painting. Like, find a place in your house to put that. I dare you. Um, <clears throat> But, so people know about his finished oil paintings. They don't know about his, I guess, um, other career or profession uh, in the arts as a printmaker and, and so on and so forth. Hopper, according to Wikipedia, Hopper created subdued drama out of commonplace subjects layered with a poetic meaning, inviting narrative interpretations. He was praised for complete verity in the America he portrayed. His career benefited significantly from his marriage to fellow artist Josephine Nivison, who contributed much to his work, both as a life model and as a creative partner. Okay. Um, you know, I've been thinking about women in the arts as well lately. Josephine, Hopper's wife, she doesn't get nearly as much press as she should. She was an artist in her own right. She has her own Wikipedia page. Unfortunately, I'm not talking about her today. But I might in the future. I might in the future because, like, it, you know, I, I've kind of re-sparked my interest and my curiosity in that area of, how should I put it, unsung or un, maybe not unrecognized, but underappreciated female artists. Um, and again, this is not me going on, like, a feminist rant. No. But it is me wanting to, like, acknowledge the contributions to the arts that the women in, in history have, have done. I think it's only fair, you know, <laughs> just speaking as a woman. But anyway, uh, maybe one day I'll do, you know, something, something to do with um, ugh, women's contributions to the arts. Or, or just, you know, because it's my channel and I get to do what I want to do, I'll just pick artists that I like, women artists that I like, and, and we'll go from there. Probably Diane Arbus. Stay tuned for that, y'all. Anyway, so, so you get this little beginning portion of the Wikipedia article about Hopper, and it already gives you a good amount of information. Did you know that he was a printmaker? Did you know that he worked in water, watercolor as well? But now you do. I'm not going to talk about his biography. I'm not going to talk about even, I'm not really even very concerned about his early life, his years of struggle, as they call them here in Wikipedia, his marriage and his, you know, and, and his death. I'm not going to talk about that. As far as, now I don't want to talk about his personality either. You know, there are art historians, there are people who write about this, research about this, who are obsessed with, like, the tabloid journalism aspect of an artist's life and private life and whatever. That's not me. I'm not into that. I just, I'm just not. I want to deal with the product, what they did, and, and, um, what they were capable of, and what contributions they left as far as, uh, their works to the world. So personality and vision, nope. Methods, no, I really don't care how he made his paintings. Subjects and themes, we'll get into that as we go. We're, and how are we going to get into the subjects and themes? We're going to look at his paintings, okay? Uh, Nighthawks is one. And this is an especially interesting photo. This is the painting It's as it's displayed in the room where I've never been here, but the Art Institute of Chicago, Tankard, if you've been there, let me know. I would love to... Um, know what what it's like because this place sounds awesome the art institute of chicago i've never been there um and place in american art i've already kind of discussed that in my own little way his place in american art like as you can see i use these wikipedia articles not just because i want to provide you with a source of information to read i also uh use them <laughs> in a kind of a lazy sneaky way as an outline and I get to say what I want to say about whatever subject they're um, doing. And then it, it, 
it says the influences he's had on other artists, which are wide and varied and etc. Exhibitions, art market. You know I love me some art market uh, fuckery. Here it is. Um, his, what, in 2018, after the death of art collector Barney E. A. Ebsworth and subsequent auction of many of the pieces from his collection, Chop Suey, 1929, was sold for 92 million, becoming the most expensive of Hopper's work ever bought at auction. Okay, and then it shows you pop culture and all the well, not maybe not all, but a lot of the places his artwork has been either reproduced or parodied or mentioned or what have you. And then this is the part that I'm really interested in. That's why I use Wikipedia. Look at this. Selected works. This is not all of them. You can open this one up, and I'll include this in the um, description as well. Uh, list of works. Okay. List of... What is this? What is this? Oh, my God. Okay, if it doesn't have a picture, am I really interested? Let me see what, what happens when I click on one of these. Oh, well, hello. Okay. All right. Yes. What is this website? WikiArt. <gasps> okay, I knew WikiArt existed, but I didn't know it was like this. Looky, looky. Wow. Moonlight interior. This is absolutely gloriously beautiful. Look at it, my God. And, of course, there's a nude woman. I mean, you can't... And this is interesting. Edward did it again. There's a nude woman, but can you really tell? Look at that. That that fascinates me. Like the the the. I mean, it's not a trompe l'oeil, a trick of the eye kind of painting, but it kind of is. Did you? If I hadn't mentioned it, would you have noticed the naked lady? I don't know. I don't know. But um. So this is what happens, I guess, when you click on that thing. Um. You know, list of works. Wow. Now I know I have to click, you know, open a new tab. But, <clears throat> um, look at all of these. Look at all of them. So I told you, he's done, he did a lot of paintings. Of course he did. He was an artist. That's his job, uh, to do a lot of paintings. I wish these were numbered so I could, like, know how many there are. There's 128, but the ones with like thumbnails are not part of the numbering. So 28, I'm not going to count them here for you. That would just be incredibly um, tedious. Uh, but, you know, there's this. So I will definitely leave this in the description if you want to explore uh, this. The following, it says here, is a list of works by American painter Edward Hopper. I've already kind of made my decision as to what I want to discuss. I might alter that a little bit. Um, I told you I wanted to discuss this one, especially, right? But before I get into that, I want to discuss this one too. By the way, y'all, um, <sighs> this is allegedly a painting that inspired Alfred Hitchcock when he created uh, the movie Psycho. Okay? This thing. It's called uh, The House by the Railroad. I want to talk about this one. I want to talk about Nighthawks. Let me see if there's any other one that I really want to just look at and just, you know, ponder with you all while we're while we're here together doing this video and you get to listen to my nonsense. Um, or maybe here. I don't know. Do they have any more, like, good examples? There's one that I really, really was into a long time ago. That I said, wow, that is amazing. Um, ugh. And I, this one, gas. Yeah, the name of the painting is gas. I want to talk about that. I was talking about freeways in Los Angeles. Yes, I'm going to talk about the gas painting. And I don't know if I'll, I'll pick any other ones, but I think I've made my choices for now. In addition to talking about his paintings and just like, you know, um, him, what, what I believe he's up to as an artist, in my opinion. Now, this is all opinion based. This is my opinion. Is it an educated opinion? I have no idea. I don't know how, I don't know whether or not I'm really all that educated, but I'm, I'm sure into this. I really like this. So I will talk about it from that perspective. This is gas. Okay. This is the one that I just fell in love with years ago when I saw it. 
Of course, in a book I saw it. I, I, wherever it is. Yeah, the Museum of Modern Art, New York. No, I haven't seen it there. But, um, Nighthawks, House by the Railroad, Gas, and we shall see if I'll talk about any of the other ones. But, again, I'm not interested in his biography. I'm not interested in his personal life or his relationship with his wife, not for the purpose of what I'm doing here and now. I'm interested in looking at the artwork. And, like I said, you know, it's, I guess that I like artists like this. I like Edward Hopper. I like Stanley Kubrick. I like Quentin Tarantino. Um, I like Salvador Dali. I like Hunter Biden. I do. I just do. Okay. F don't, don't even try to fight me on that. You'll lose. So that's how I feel about that. There's a lot of artists that I like, and there's a lot of artists that it's, for me, it's not a matter of liking. I mean, I do like things. I have preferences, but I don't, I don't know if this is going to sound like insane or not. I don't allow myself to dislike artworks. That's my personal thing. I, I'm not telling you to do that, but that's what I do. I don't allow myself to dislike artworks. I allow myself to have a preference for certain things and, and, um, you know, and I guess no emotion at all for, for other things. But, an art, an, a work of art is somebody's statement. Yeah, that's their communication. That's what they are trying to put forth and um, under, uh, an understanding of something through that medium, whatever whatever form it takes, whether it's a painting, a sculpture, a photograph, you, what you name it, right? And how can I like dislike somebody's uh, intellectual or even in some cases spiritual or emotional output it's not for me to like make that kind of judgment uh, of, a, of a disliking or or whatever it's it's not my place i feel in my it that's that's how i feel about it but um i've been i already made another video tonight <laughs> this one okay this one over here um rum break the shining did you know about the ray gun four minutes ago are you serious, YouTube? Four minutes ago. Okay. Oh, I got four views. Yay. 25 minutes ago. Okay, so I refreshed the page. But um, I'm going to go and take a teensy-weensy little coffee break. Uh, my mouth is dry from all the talking. <laughs> and I'll come back and we will get into it. First, I'll talk about his, not his background as in like his biography and his personal life, but like maybe a little bit about like when people say he was a realist painter, an American realist. What does that mean? I'll talk about that a little bit. I'll talk about like one of his teachers, or, or at least like point you in the direction of reading about this man on Wikipedia, Robert Henri. Um, that was one of Hopper's and, and his wife, Josephine's uh, teachers. And then of course the Ashcan school, but which Robert Henri was part of. And then we'll get into just kind of admiring and marveling at these paintings of his Nighthawks, House by the Railroad, Gas, and I don't know if I'll pick any other ones. We shall see. So I will be, oh, no, sorry. I will be right back. I will leave you this, with this gorgeous image uh, until I get my little coffee. So hold on a minute. I'll be right back. And I'm back. Okay, so what I said a minute ago, for you guys a minute ago, for me a couple of minutes ago, I've already introduced you to Edward Hopper, and I've shown you what I want to talk about, which paintings, yellow, there's that one, there's that one. Um, he's called, here, an American realist. Um, so I'll talk about American realism for a second. I'll read what Wikipedia says about it. Why shouldn't I? American realism was a style in art, music, and literature that depicted contemporary social realities and the lives of everyday activities of ordinary people. Okay. Uh, the movement began in literature in the mid-19th century and became an important tendency in visual art in the early 20th century. Whether a cultural portrayal or a scenic view of downtown New York City, American realist works attempted to define what was real. Now, this sentence here. All right. I don't know whether or not I really agree with this, personally. 
whether a cultural portrayal or a scenic view of downtown New York City, American realist works attempted to define what was real. Mm. In my opinion, this is where I'm coming from, a work of art always, there's always a gap. There's always, like, some people believe that art tells the truth. I believe the exact opposite, in my opinion. I believe that art lies. Not necessarily, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that is how I feel about it. Let me keep going with this paragraph, or the second paragraph here. In the U.S. at the beginning of the 20th century, a new generation of painters, writers, and journalists were coming of age. Many of the painters felt the influence of older U.S. artists such as Thomas Eakins, Mary Cassatt, John Singer Sargent, James McNeil Whistler, Winslow Homer, Homer uh, Child Hassam, J. Alden Weir, Thomas Pollock Anschutz, and William Merritt Chase. However, they were interested in creating new and more urbane works that reflected city life and a population that was more urban than rural in the U.S. as it entered the new century. Listen, this is what, what we're being told, okay? It, it was, it was city-oriented. It was urban-oriented. For some reason, that was fascinating to these people at this time. At this time in history, the 19th century becoming the 20th century, and certainly like from the like 1920s onward, it was about progress. It was about te technology that the world had never seen before during this time in history, at least American history, and, and European history as well. So the world was becoming more and more and more industrialized, uh, it was becoming more and more and more run by machines. Okay. And people, there, there were groups of people who were really excited about that. And there were groups of people who were not excited about that at all. Um, and you see the distinction in the art. So what this is telling us here, American modernism is another one. It says see also. We're not going to do that today. Some other time. But, uh, there was this hope, there was this, you know, this technology and, and machines and, and what technology and machines could do. People were really, really sort of, uh, hopeful and anticipating the best from that. Now, once again, this is the beginning, the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. They had a rude awakening later on in that century with World War One. And then later, of course, World War Two, and like all the other wars too, and not just in the United States, or not even the United States. I don't think the United States, outside of Pearl Harbor, in the twentieth century, really experienced any kind of attack um, from uh, you know another another uh, country or force. But <clears throat> the wars of the twentieth century made artists in in uh, in um as the 20th century wore on made a lot of artists and a lot of people in general just very wary of this technology but we're not at that point yet with hopper we're getting there we're getting there and there's there's a sense of him like rethinking this this excitement over technology and uh this hope that people had with regard to um, with regard to this technology and alleged progress. Now, America in the early 20th century, I'm not going to talk about this now, but I, I mean, I kind of already did industrial, economic, social, and cultural change, big change, really huge change. The events of the 20th century, all of the stuff that happened both in the United States and the rest of the world in the 20th century, um, <sighs> So much more stuff happened in the 20th century than seemingly like all the centuries before it, as far as not, not necessarily just the technological developments, but the pace of the technological developments. Like in 1901, for example, like in, or the year 1900, like they didn't have airplanes. Okay. They didn't like think about that. We can't imagine a world without them. These people at this time in history grew up in a world without them. They, they didn't, they think of them as necessary because they didn't exist in the year 2000. You know, very different. 
and the 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 amount of time separating those two years, 1900 and the year 2000, exactly 100 years. So we went from horse and carriages and no airplanes and no techno no electricity in many places, um, no refrigeration, no indoor plumbing, no um, supermarkets, no freeways, no radio, no TV, no movies, no nothing. We went from that to everything we had in the in the year 2000. And it was like one hell of a ride between those two years, that century. Okay, a uh, continuous wave of, of European immigrants. Yep, I told you, that's, you know, my family. Uh, art, and, art, art and artistic expression. Uh, American realism attempted to portray the exhaustion and cultural exuberance of the figurative American landscape and the life of ordinary Americans at home. Artists used the feelings, textures, and sounds of the city to influence the color, texture, and look of their creative projects. Okay. Uh, musicians noticed the quick and fast-paced nature of the early 20th century and responded with a fresh and new tempo. Writers and authors told a new story about Americans, boys and girls, real Americans could have grown up with. Pulling away from fantasy and focusing on the now, American realism presented a new gateway and a breakthrough, including modernism. And yeah, this is the time of modernism. Uh, and what it means to be in the present. The Ashcan School, also known as the Eight, and the group called Ten American Painters, created the core of the new American modernism in the visual arts. So they talk about the Ashcan School, of which I guess Hopper is considered a member. Okay, these other people, um, Sloan, Glackens, Lukes, uh, Robert Henri, like Ro Robert Henri died in 1921. Hopper died, you know, about 40 or so years later. But they're grouped into the same kind of a an ash can, if you don't know what that is, is basically a can that people used at that time in history for their fireplaces or their, you know, if they had a wood burning store stove, like they had to have a place to put all the ash from the fuel that they would burn. Usually, I mean, I don't know if it was usually wood, but wood, coal, whatever. And these things produce ash when they're burned. You got to put it somewhere. So the ash can was, I guess, their equivalent to our trash can that we all have in our kitchens today. Um, and this was like real life. This was life as it really was back then. Uh, the gritty, kind of sooty, uh, ashy, dusty realness of everyday life. That's what they called the Ashcan School. And here are some of them. I kind of want to do a separate thing, but this is um, Robert Henri, uh, one of Hopper's teachers, one of, I guess one of his big influences. And he was born 1865, right at the end of the Second World, or not the Second, the Civil War, and died 1921, right at the very, I guess, beginning of what we now call the Jazz Age. And he was an important American realist and a member of the Ashcan School. He was interested in the spectacle of common life. He focused on individuals, strangers, quickly passing in the streets and towns and cities. His was a sympathetic rather than a comic portrayal of people, often using a dark background to add to the warmth of the person depicted. Henry's, or Henri's, works were characterized by vigorous brushstrokes and bold impasto, uh, which stressed the materiality of the paint. Henri influenced Glackens, Luke's, Shin, and Sloan. Doesn't say Hopper, but he should be there too. In 1906, he was elected to the National Academy of Design, but when painters in his circle were rejected, for the Academy's 1907 ex exhibition, he accused fellow jurors of bias and walked off the jury, resolving to organize a show of his own. He later referred to the Academy as a cemetery of art, and this was going on in Europe as well. Please bear in mind, 1907, I believe, was the year that Pablo Picasso, in Europe, he painted Demoiselles d'Avignon. Um, and that was a revolutionary painting in its own, own right for its own reasons. And now we have Robert Henri, like, sh stirring shit up over here in the United States, walking off the jury and whatever. And this is one of his paintings. Let me t uh, 
finish this and then take you to um, Robert Henri's page. Here are other visual artists. You can look through this in your own right. I'm not going to go through artists or, or writers or journalists. No, I'm just concentrating on painting. Here's Robert Henri's page. Did they just make a damn mistake here? Wait a minute. Here's 1921 is the year of his death. Here is 1929. Whatever. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that. But, you know, he lived to be 64, 1929. Believe it or not, back then, 64 was considered old as dirt. Not anymore because of the, all the technology, y'all. And then a lot of naked lady paintings down here. Or just women, a good number of them nude. Um, and this is, I guess, one of his most famous works. Snow in New York, 1902, oil on canvas. And it's at the National, National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. This is the person who, I guess, trained uh, Edward Hopper. I, I guess you can see Henri's influence here. Um, let me see if I can... I'm not trying to upload the painting oh lord jesus now you know how how much of a close-up you can get um looking at these now this looks like it's dirty doesn't it it <laughs> look the painting looks like it needs to be cleaned but no i i mean i'm assuming that this is deliberate on 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 robert Henri's part look the grayness I, maybe this is part of the reason they called it the ash can school um, this is the time period in history where people were still burning things so they could cook, right? Like, you know, wood, coal, whatever. Um, and the streets. This is an urban setting. We have a horse-drawn carriage. We have these, you know, tall buildings. And especially at the time, now this is not the time of sky skyscrapers. That comes a little bit later. Um, but look at this this feeling of claustrophobia i guess you can you can say from this painting this this street in new york i don't know where this is i'm sure it's easy to find out but i'm not going to take the time to do that now the height of these buildings the the kind of narrowest narrowness of this street the lack of sunlight or or any kind of kind like any kind of light or, or brightness in this painting uh snow yes it's white I, from what I'm told, I've never really seen it up close, but this is dirty. This is like city um, snow with like all kinds of stuff like smashed into it from probably the wheels of these carriages and people's feet and all kinds of stuff. This is, <laughs> it's in its own way beautiful, but at the same time, there's something about this scene that gives you a, a sense of, in my opinion, in my opinion, anxiety. Okay, that's what I think uh, that Henri was going for in this painting. Y'all let me know. Y'all let me know in the comments. If I could buy this painting and have it, I sure would. Let's just, if it was like affordable for somebody like me, I would definitely get this and put it on my wall and like look at this and just think about life and shit. I sure would. Let me, let me go on to the Ashcan School just a second um yeah there there's that so that's Henri this is the Ashcan school in general these are the I guess origin and development is and Edward Hopper is part of the Ashcan school I guess just because of when he started like really like being popular as an artist um but also I guess because he was influenced by somebody like Henri um and 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 maybe also his subject matter which is you you could view it as one interpretation could be that it is very bleak it is really terrifically bleak now there's also george bellows cliff cliff dwellers there's this is a famous one uh new york city's lower east side there's lots of well not lots but there's pictures of boxing um Another George Bellows, Men on the Docks. So, like, people who work for a living are featured in these paintings. Um, Pennsylvania Station. Look at this. By Another one by George Bellows. Wow. I'm not going to, like, but doesn't this look like some kind of 
like fantastical thing. It doesn't look like a train station or any kind of station. It looks like some like something from like some medieval story about chivalry or whatever. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. And they say they were trying to get away from that. I don't know. I just don't know. But the Ashcan School, I'll read you a little bit about that. Uh, the Ashcan School, also called the Ashcan School, was an artistic move in, movement in the United States during the late 19th, early 20th century that produced works portraying scenes of daily life in New York, often in the city's poorer neighborhoods. The artists working in this style, you can get, get through this on your own. I'm not going to read all those names. Uh, some of them met studying together under the renowned realist Thomas Thomas Anschutz in, at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Others met in the newspaper offices of Philadelphia where they worked as illustrators. Teresa Bernstein, who studied at the Philadelphia School of Design for Women, was also part of the Ashcan School. Uh, she was friends with many of its better-known members, including Sloan, with whom she co-founded the Society of Independent Artists. Uh, the movement, which took some inspiration from Walt Whitman's epic poem, Leaves of Grass, has been seen as emblematic of the spirit of political rebellion of the period. Okay. All right. Please bear in mind, you know, like I said, a lot of these people um, kind of made their exit from this world before the Second World War got started or like right after um the first world war Let's look at these these dates of birth and death here Nin the death dates 1929 1933 1938 1951 for sloan 1953 and so on and so forth um yeah so they were there for the beginning of what we now call the modern world Okay, postmodernism, if you're interested, if you're just curious about that term, postmodernism, that begins, as far as I know, uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, and onward. Are we still in postmodern, uh, in the postmodern world? I don't know. I don't know. I know that postmodernism was being, like, actively discussed as recently as, like, the 2010s, like that decade. So we might very well still be in the postmodern world. I don't know, because it's hard to tell. This is the analogy that I use, okay? Um, like weather, right? Meteor meteorological yeah, phenomena. Tornadoes, hurricanes, blizzards, snow, like, yeah, blizzards, snowstorms, um, rain, whatever. Those, that's that's what we call the weather, right? And these are big events, and they're very destructive, or they can be. Hurricanes, tornadoes, whatever. It is very hard to analyze a tornado, for example, or a hurricane while it's happening. Yeah, we have tools to do that now. Like like I said, that technology, okay? Like airplanes and, and all kinds of stuff. But you as a human being, like an individual person... You're not going to go and, like, try, unless you're a storm chaser. But even they know well enough, like, to try and stay away from the the, the thing. But you, you can't, like, go right up to a tornado and, like, look at it up close. Can you? You can't, like, go right up to, I don't know, a hurricane and look at it up close. Can you? You can observe it from afar. You can take data and then use that data or whatever, photographs, what have you, and try to analyze that meteorological event after it's happened. Because it's just not safe to do it while it's going on. And it's not practical. Even if it's maybe not so unsafe, it's not practical. So you think about it and look at it and research it and whatever after it's happened. Same thing with like things like these art movements. Like they're named after... No, they're not named after. Some of them are named while, like, you know, somebody thinks up a term or calls something, like some word, or something, and it sticks, right? Postmodernism. I don't know who came up with that. 
I don't know when, it, I mean, I have an idea of when it began. Late 60s, early 70s, definitely. Are we still in it? I'm not sure. I'm not, because a lot of these things, there's no definite, like, beginning or end date. Um, and we certainly, for as far as postmodernism, I don't think we can figure out the end date right now. At least not at this point. But that's just how I look at it. Now, these are the people who influenced Hopper, allegedly. I mean, are these his only influences? No. He was probably aware of other art from the past, other other um, movements going on at the same time in the United States and elsewhere. But this is what Wikipedia tells us it were his main influences or whatever. Okay, cool. Now let's get into the paintings, finally. I, this is, you know, this is what you've been waiting for, if you're watching this at all. Uh, this is probably going to be one of those videos where I don't get a huge number of <laughs> viewers, but that's okay. Now, what do we see here? Uh, yeah, look at, look at this extreme close-up. Do I want to do such an extreme close-up? I don't know. I don't know. I want to get it in the frame, that's for sure. Okay, so this is the Nighthawks, like I said, 1942. Okay, I don't know if I should talk about this one first or last. This is the, what is this called? House by, I think, House by the Railroad Tracks. Yep, this is allegedly, allegedly, we can't be sure about these things, but allegedly the one that Alfred Hitchcock used to inspire, or at least partially, um, Psycho, you know, Norman Bates and, and what have you. And then there's this one. Yes. When is this one from? Yeah, 1940. Okay. So, let me check out the dates for House by the Railroad Tracks. I'm sure the date is over there on the other page. I just forgot it. I know this is 1940 now. This is 1942. And, <laughs> hold on. Gotta scroll down. House by the Railroad Track. Ooh, 1925. Well, that's interesting. I did not know that. Now, this is... I, sh I might as well just start out with this one and work my way through. Okay? Like, chronologically. So, House by the Railroad Tracks. This is an old Victorian house. One of those, like, painted lady houses. I guess that's what they were called. I'm not an architectural historian. Um, but this is a Victorian house from and the victorian age was named after the the reigning monarch of britain at the time queen victoria <clears throat> and these houses were popping up everywhere in the united states during that time i think the this is after i don't i don't exactly know or remember when queen victoria died was it like the late 19th or the early 20th century i don't know you can go ahead and look that up if that interests you but these homes were during their own time, like let's just say the late nineteenth century, they were um considered like you know the the latest, newest, hippest, chicest thing as far as architecture and house building. They were meant to represent a per the, the owner of the house's status, okay they were meant they looked gaudy, they were meant to look gaudy. They were meant to just stick out and, and have this imposing and um, impressive, like, presence. Yeah, they were meant to get your attention. This is not the kind of house that's trying to, like, you know, if it was a person, it would be, um, <laughs> uh, it would be a drag queen, in my opinion, if a Victor an old Victorian house, but, like, you know, this is this is this is architecture that is not trying to be shy or bashful or or um or hide from from the viewer or hide from scrutiny or anything like that. No, this is to be seen, right? And now but at this time when Hopper was painting this in nineteen twenty five in nineteen twenty five when Hopper was painting this, this house at 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 that time not the year 2022, no, the year 1925, <clears throat> this house was already like kind of a relic, or just, it, it was considered passé, right? And whatever it represented at the time when it was built, those ideas were on their way out. 
So with with regard to Victorian architecture or clothing or whatever, in 1925, that was when the flappers were, you know, flapping with their kind of formless clothing. That's what I think of when I think of clothing for women in the 1920s. There's no, there's no curves. There's no shape. It's just straight up and down like a ruler. Um, <coughs> excuse me. There are embellishments, but like, you know, why did they even bother? That's how I look at clothing and fashion in the 20s. It's beautiful in its own way, but there's like, there's, it's streamlined. Maybe that's a nice way to put it. Uh, and that's what the 20s were about. Machines. Machines, machines, machines. And streamlined everything. And trying to figure out a way a machine could make your life better and easier. And, you know, much more awesome than your life would be without them. And they even thought of houses in the 1920s as a form of a machine, maybe like a machine for a living. Uh, do we think of houses that way now? Yeah, I think we do. We Houses contain a lot of technology now, some that we're not even aware is technology uh, in its own right. We don't, we don't think of electricity as something that we can do without. Yeah, we can. People did it for centuries before the 20th century. Like, yeah, we can do without electricity. People, people did it before. We can do without plumbing. We can do without dishwashers. We can do without electric or gas stoves. We can do without all of that. But like we've gotten to a point in our development where we would be lost or we would have a really hard time adjusting if electricity and gas and gasoline and all of these technologies were taken away from us. We, we, we would be beside ourselves. Now, this house comes from a time period where, no, people would not be beside themselves if they didn't have electricity, gas, cars, airplanes, whatever, because none of those things existed when this house and this painting was built. And, you know, so let me, like, I think that I've said enough. And also, check out this house. It's got design elements that don't make any damn sense. People think of these houses as very beautiful. And they are, in their own way. But they don't make a whole lot of sense. Look at this porch, for God's sake. We've got this Greek-inspired porch. Okay, cool. And then all of this back here. What in the world is going on? What in the world is going on? Okay, but never mind that. And and these houses contain stained glass for windows and all kinds of decorations and embellishments and ornamentation and God help you, and the the you know the staircases and ah oh, like you know hand carved uh, woodworking and and all kinds of things. Kitchens not so much. Like kitchens weren't really a big deal at the time. Um, people didn't think of. You know, at this time in history, when this kind of house was being built, people didn't think of kitchens as a priority. It was just a, you you know, a utilitarian room where you went in there and chopped stuff up and made your dinner. It didn't have to be beautiful, like we think of kitchens now. That's that's one issue. But next to this house, look at it. This damn railroad. 1925. Railroad that has been built. Uh... You know, so probably the house came before the railroad. Okay, so the house was there and a community was there. A, you know, group of people lived there. Who, who, whoever are, they are or were, wherever this is in America, I assume like the Northeast because that's where Hopper lived uh, and traveled mostly, at least as far as I can tell from reading the stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then... Here comes a railroad. Here comes progress in the form of uh, transportation technology, this railroad that was going to make life awesome for everybody because they could transport things uh, more efficiently and much more quickly and everything, everything, raw materials and food and people and everything. It, it, The railroad was just going to change the world for the better. And here's this old house next to it. So what is Hopper saying in this painting? It's not, <clears throat> you know, some people, they look at these paintings and they think like, yeah, no, it's obvious what he's saying. Like, uh, 
progress is, you know, some people say, oh, no, Hopper's saying that in this painting that progress technology is bad and this old way of living was good. Or some people say, oh, no, Hopper's saying that, you know, the old way of living was bad, like this, what, what this Victorian house represents, um, and that the railroad is good. Or, you know, some pe I don't know what to think per personally. It, maybe he's saying both are bad. I don't see any goodness in this painting. This is not a happy painting. This is not a painting where you look at either the house or the railroad. And by the way, look at this. This this railroad, it's down here at the in the bottom third, like close to the close to the bottom of the of the canvas here, and it's just slash slicing its way through this canvas at this bottom part. It's cutting off the bottom part. You can't see the very bottom part of this house. You can't see, like, the steps that lead up to the porch. You can't see, like, the area around the house, like the garden or the yard or whatever. No, you just see from this point up the house. So the house doesn't have uh, feet, so to speak, or we can't see the feet of the house. Or, like, the lower, like, maybe not the feet, but, like, from knees downward, if the house was a person, you know, it would be cut off at the knees by this railroad. These railroad tracks, what is he saying? This is not a happy painting. Let's just put it that way. This is not like a joyful um, painting where you look at it and you're filled with uh, hope and happiness and and a, a good kind of anticipation or a dreamy feeling or... No, 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 no. This is confusing. In a bad way, in a negative way, the emotions that are conjured by a picture like this are like, you know, what what what's going on here? You don't know what to think or or whatever. This is a comment about quote unquote progress and technology and whatever. Again, this is 1925. <sighs> but what's going on? And I mean, a a couple of videos back. Wait a minute, where's the damn thing? I did something that I don't know if I'll ever do again. We'll see. I read William Faulkner's A Rose for Emily. Okay, and I don't remember, like, when this thing was published. Oh, I think it was, like, the early 1930s or something like that. I think, like, 1932, 34, whatever. Um, that's what this painting makes me think of. It makes me think of Miss Emily's house in a ro in a rose for emily because miss emily in that story by faulkner she's like whether you realize it or not when you read the thing or whether you realized it or not when you read the thing in a high school in english class miss emily is kind of deliberately making herself an obstacle to progress right she's sort of like you know she kills the guy who's there to put put roads in and whatever so this is what Miss Emily is trying to avoid, uh, save her town or spare her town from in that story. At least that's the way I interpret it. Um, what is Hopper saying, though? Does Hopper agree with Faulkner? Or like, are they, can they be compared as far as his literature, his writing and, and Hopper's paintings? I think maybe because they're like doing this around the same time. So, for, you know, for that reason alone. But also, like, what is it that each of them is trying to say? It d does it snap together? I think it does. In my opinion, I think it does. Y'all let me know in the comments how, if you agree with me or disagree with me or have just a completely different perspective regarding these ideas or issues. Um, it's your choice. Now, let me go on to the next one. Gas. Yes. Yes. From 1940. What did I say? 1940. Exactly 1940. So... You know, the the First World War, I'm not really clear on the dates of, not the First World War, excuse me, the Second World War. But like 1941, as I said earlier in this video, was I think America's official entry because of Pearl Harbor. Um, like they couldn't ignore what was going on uh, across the pond or in Europe or in Germany or whatever anymore because of Pearl Harbor. So this was a year, this painting was made about a year before that. Um, does that, did that influence Hopper? 
did that influence his, you know, whatever was going on in the world at the time, politically, socially, economically, um, and et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so on, what have you. Like, did that influence his thoughts, his mind, his motivations for creating a painting like this in that year, 1940? I don't know. We can only speculate, you know. Um, maybe somebody interviewed him. Maybe somebody talked to him. Maybe somebody talked to his wife. I don't know. But this painting is called Gas. All right, let me see if I got, like, the dimensions for this painting. Where is it? Oh, this is chronologically ordered. Well, well, well. Hold on. This makes everything different now. Uh, 19, oh, here it is. Um, 1940. Okay, so this painting is 26 and a quarter inches by 40 and a quarter inches for my friends in countries other than the United States. 66.7 centimeters by 102.2 centimeters. So 40 inches. Okay, 36 inches is about 3 feet. So the width of this thing is about 3 feet and 4 inches. And the height is about two feet and two inches, a little over, with, you know, the quarter on each measurement. Interesting. Interesting. So this is not a huge, huge painting. You could definitely find room in your house for one of these. I always look at these things like I'm shopping. I always look at art like I'm shopping, like where, if I could put that in my home, where would I put it? Or, you know, can I put it, can, could it fit anywhere? Um, I don't know why. I don't know why I do that. It's just like my weird little thing. But <clears throat> so we have this gas station. We've got, I guess, one, two, three uh, gasoline pumps here. And then we've got this like building that I guess is where the attendant at the gas station like spends his time or, you know, takes the money into or where he keeps the motor oil or whatever. I don't know. Uh, this little building with this little thing at the top. I don't know what the hell that is. Um, is it a chimney? Is it like a little... It looks like... the, the th I don't know what this is called. This architectural element that is on top of the roof of this gas station building. And... Wow. I'm noticing all kinds of shit about this painting that I never noticed before. If I didn't make these videos, like, I don't know what I would do. But, okay, let me just deal with this thing on the roof over here. This looks very churchy to me. This, like, looks like it could be a steeple. Or it's like a miniaturized version of a church steeple on top of this gas station attendant building. And then there's lights on inside. Um, these gas pumps, these things, these round things at the top of the gas pumps, they're apparently um, glowing. So... They've got something in them that makes them glow. I don't know what that is. A light bulb, maybe. Um, they've got this sign over here. Is this a neon sign or not? I'm not sure. Um, hold on. Mabugas. Okay. Let me not, like, comment on that. But there's something about this painting. What was I saying? Oh, yes. So this, this thing on top of the uh, roof... It looks very church-like. It looks like an architectural element that you would find like on a church, especially a Protestant church. You know what I mean. Um, and then the building itself, like this is the man who works there, I assume, because there's no cars here. Um, so like, why would he be there like fiddling with this gas pump if he's not the attendant? Now look at the height of this man. I don't know if he's like a regular height, if he's a little taller than average, a little shorter than average. I'm not sure. But look at his height. And then visually, like, you know, I don't know if you want to take a ruler or whatever. I don't know if you want to go that far. But check out the height of this man and the height of this doorway. It's about exactly the same. At least it looks that way to me, visually. Yep. This is a small-ass house. Or, you know, gas station building, whatever it is, not a house. I hope he doesn't live there. But this is weird. So Hopper, like I said, they say, oh, you know, Hopper was influenced by the Ashcan school and Robert Henri he was his, you know, one of his main influences, one of his teachers, wherever he went to school. Okay, cool. Um, he's also being influenced by early Renaissance art in this painting. And this 
you know, the height of this gas station attendant and the height of this building and the doorway to enter the building, that tells me for sure, for sure, for sure that Hopper is, it's pretty, it's pretty certain that he's being influenced very, very, very strongly by early uh, Renaissance art or like late medieval Italian art. Um, I can't like off the top of my head net list the artists or I wish I had thought of this sooner. I would have lined up a, a tab for you to look at and compare um, because during that time in the development of art or the, the development of what became later the Renaissance, this is the shit they would do. They would make the artists at the time would make the people just as tall as the building standing right next to them. That makes no sense at all. That makes absolutely no sense at all. People are not as tall as buildings, usually. I mean, even if it's like a woodshed, like th that woodshed is probably still taller than the average person. Usually. Usually. Um, but definitely, like the buildings depicted in these early Renaissance, late medieval um, paintings. And we have that here. We have that here. We have, in my opinion, this is my opinion, uh, Edward Hopper mimicking that in this way. And now, the gas pumps are about the same height as, again, the building. Like, at least this this part of the building where there's, um, I don't know what the hell to call this, like the gutter. Is that a gutter? I'm not sure. They're, they're the same height as the gutter of this building. Interesting. I don't know what this is here. That's the thing about Edward Hopper's art. There's always this really mysterious part of it that you cannot explain. <clears throat> no matter how hard you try like this this in the in the foreground here to the right this corner this thing what is it what is this thing is it another building is it a fence is it what what could it possibly be i have no idea but it's there and he's cut it off and he's cut the building off we only see like this part of the building there's more maybe not a lot more but there's more over to the right that we can't see and he he doesn't care whether or not we get to see that he's being very 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 what one might call curt um if, if you know if you were talking to somebody and you did this it would be called curt and being very short with somebody or you know that's another way of saying curt um a short tempered or, or not maybe short tempered but you don't want to use a lot of words for whatever reason you don't want to uh, expend your energy and think up words to communicate with somebody, usually because you have some degree of contempt for them. Now, is, <laughs> is that what he's doing here in this painting? I don't know. But in my opinion, it's a possibility. It's definitely a possibility. And we don't, so we don't see the rest of this building, this thing in the foreground on the right here that is seems to be in a shadow of some kind. I don't know. Uh, we don't even know. There's not enough of it for even us, the viewer, to be able to kind of determine what it even is that we're looking at, this part over here. And we know there's more. That We know there's more building over here that we can't see. We know there's more gas station over here to the right that we can't see. Edward is not con concerned with showing us the full picture. This, this here is what we're supposed to be concentrating on. He's very... Um, assertively and very bluntly telling us that like don't worry about this over here or or he's building mystery i don't know i don't know which one it is is he like just telling you what to look at or or building a sense of uh your curiosity about the unknown i don't know um but there's more to this gas station that we can't see there's more to this building that we can't see there's more to this man that we can't see we can't see his facial features you know, who, wh whatever perspective this is being painted from. Um, yeah, we don't know what he looks like. We know that he's wearing what looks like, I don't know, overalls. Oh, no, those are not overalls. What am I saying? It looks like pants and a vest and a shirt and a tie. I guess people dressed much better back then. Um, <clears throat> gas station attendants. And he's not wearing any kind of hat, which is interesting, you know. Hats usually, at the, at least at this part in at least part of history, they told the people surrounding you like what station you occupied in society. This guy isn't wearing one. I don't know why. 
And, and then there's all of this in the background, okay? There's all of this, and there's the road, okay? And by the way, the existence of this gasoline station, 1940. <clears throat> the road is the reason for the gas station's existence. And the road means that there are cars. And cars means that people run out of gas and need to come fill up here. This looks like it's in the middle of nowhere. This thing looks like it's in absolutely in the middle of, you know, some, what do they call it, a little podunk place in the middle of nowhere. Uh, doesn't matter what state you're in, USA. Right? There's nothing around. Or, it, like, is there anything beyond these trees? And the, these trees in the background, they are thick. They are absolutely, like, I wouldn't want to go in there. In, into these, into the, like, yeah, like the Cure song, Into the Trees, right? Terrifying. Terrifying. Just imagine the darkness in here and, like, how easily you could get lost or whatever. And that's what he puts on the other side of the road where this gasoline station is. So he, maybe, you know, maybe he isn't disdainful of his viewer, but he's maybe building, like, mystery, curiosity, intrigue with, you know, not showing us this whole building, not even, like, letting us know what this thing is, and then these these mysterious-ass trees on the other side of the road. Now, another element here is this is probably at dusk. It's not completely nighttime, because the sky isn't, like, completely dark or black, but, like, this is sunset, or, like, just, just at that point, just at, I, I think you know what I mean, just at that point, like, where it's, the sun has just set, and there's still, like, that beautiful purple, pink kind of look to the color of the sky, especially if there's clouds and everything, and, and there's just this wonder that you get inside of you, that like when you're looking at the sky during that time of day when the sun is setting or it's just, just very, very recently, just a moment ago, the sun has disappeared. Um, like, you know, for me, uh, I, into the ocean, like where I live. Uh, and then there's that like purple kind of glow to the sky. And, and is that what's going on here? Is this like dusk, what they call dusk? So he's showing us this mysterious-ass gas station um, next to this mysterious-ass road. Where does it lead? We don't know where this road is. We don't know, like, you know, where where you're going or where you're coming from as far as this road is concerned. And then this terrifying, like, thick, uh, thick-ass forest over here. Hmm interesting and then okay so we have all of this we have this red the gas station the pumps are red so red you know gets your attention that's a color that's bright red is a color that will get your attention almost every single time and then the sign you know that trees 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 and then this gra I, I assume this is grass at the floor of these trees right um and then the gas station, it's paved and everything. Okay. And then more trees over here to the right. So, like, there's more trees beyond this gas station building. And then we have this. Okay, I'm, I'm extreme close-upping this. It's called Mabugas. I mean, I don't know if there was a gas station company at the time called Mabugas. And you know what? If I had the time and the patience and, and the resolve... I might research that, but I just don't right now. But I, I want to focus on this sign because of the symbol or the, the image on it, a pegasus. Okay? Now, is there a gas... I mean, y'all help me out in the comments. Let me know. Is there a gas, uh, you know, a, a gas or a petroleum company or whatever that... The, the logo or the, or the monogram or the symbol for it or whatever you call it is a Pegasus. I think there might be or there might have been in the past. If there is, I don't remember. Or if there was, I don't remember. Somebody help me. Somebody help me in the comments. Let me know. Uh, that would be awesome if you could do that. If you, if you do have that knowledge, if you can easily recall that quickly, um, that would be awesome. Uh, what is up with that Pegasus? And it's red too. Pegasus is a figure from mythology. 
What is it doing in the middle of all of this? At dusk, creepy ass forest over there, more more trees over there, this curtailed building here. We we don't get to see the whole thing. Then this man, like he doesn't look particularly happy, but you know, we can't really see his face. And that's kind of the point. Um, that's what people say with regard to Edward Hopper's paintings. They're about alienation and a loss of identity. And his a lot of his figures in his paintings simply don't have discernible facial features. Why? I mean, one can only speculate as to why, but, it, you know, in, in the modern world, I guess that's the argument. In the modern world, your identity becomes, as an individual, your identity becomes less and less and less and less important. I don't know what to think about that. I, I don't know what to think about that. It's difficult to think about these things sometimes. But, and then the red color. Why, you know, is this just, he's drawing your eye to this part of the painting with the red? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe there's, like, he's being sneaky. Uh, Edward Hopper was a sneaky painter. Like, you know, look at this. This ain't sneaky. Oh, yes, it, it sure is. And look also this red. Right. Oh, Lord. Wait a minute, is there red here? There sure is. Okay, so I told you that with this one, he's like letting you, in my opinion, he's letting you know that he's referencing late medieval, uh, like really, really, really late medieval, or like maybe even late Gothic, I don't know, art, and or, and or really, 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 really early Renaissance, when they didn't give a shit about perspective. I mean, they were trying, but it wasn't what it became like during the time when Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, like Ninja Turtles came along. Okay. Um, yeah. Raf yeah. Raphael, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Donatello. Donatello was like a century before the other three, but like, never mind that. I don't know why. Uh, they're always talked about like as the big four, but one is like a century before the others. Never mind all that. But um, so he's citing like the earth, like let's just, I'll make a decision here. The early, early, early Renaissance, where people and buildings were the same height in those paintings. He's also, I think he's using a conceit of Baroque art, which is like, you see these red chimneys, you see these red gas pumps, and then in the Nighthawks, there's like, the red is... is he's treating it in a somewhat different way. It's called Splash of Red. It's called a, a, it's a conceit of Baroque art, especially you'll find it in works by somebody like Peter Paul Rubens. Okay. And there's like, you know, my art history professor where I took a class on Baroque art and we talked about Velasquez and we talked about uh, Peter Paul Rubens. And there was not necessarily with, with Velasquez, he's known for his use of black, but I'm talking about Peter Paul Rubens in the Netherlands, the splash of red. Oh, there was always a splash of red with Peter Paul Rubens. And it was always there. Why it was there? I asked my professor. I, I asked my professor why. Why is that splash of red always there? Didn't have an answer for me. So that means I don't have an answer for you. But definitely it is eye-catching. Like I said, the, the color red. And I've been dealing with the color red in my movie analysis, too. The Shining, Kill Bill. Lots and lots of red. Um, usually has to do with blood, but not always. Or maybe indirectly or symbolically. It's hard to tell sometimes, but we'll get into it. Uh, it definitely gets, that color definitely gets your attention. And red, or maybe like something like blood, uh, or you know, red is symbolic of something. It's there for. It's never there just cause, right? It's always there for a reason. It, that that color always has a really important job to do when you see it in art of any kind, just about, or clothing or whatever. Um, so we talked about this, like splash of red. Yep, yep, yep. Edward Hopper citing and referencing the early renaissance and the baroque with that like real real sneaky though real sneaky okay let's get into the nighthawks last but not least my favorite one of my favorites i love them all i love all of edward hopper's works this one okay so this is 1942 so the second world war is like well underway at this point and there's a lot of death there's a lot of bloodshed there's a lot of horror and you know, 
<laughs> Did people learn anything from that? I don't know. I just don't know. I don't think they learned anything. But look at the look at the use of red. Like since we just talked about the use of red, before I get into anything anything else, look at this. It looks like you know he's using a lot the building across the street over here. That whole top floor is red. Wow. Then inside of the diner, Phillies, I guess it's called, this whole counter, it's red, but it's a real sneaky red, because it's a, like a, a brownish muted red, but it's there, even though the red is mixed with another color. It's the, the, um, our, the, the red, it's still there. It's still there. It's muted, but it's still there. And it's still doing its thing. It's still doing the job that red does whenever it shows up in a work of art or in clothing or whatever. It's still there. And then this woman at the counter, what color is she wearing? Red. What color is her hair? Red. Lord Edward. Edward, you sneaky son of a bitch. Okay, listen. So here we are, this famous American painting. This famous, it's called the Nighthawks. I don't care how it got that name. That's not what I'm here to analyze. I'm here to analyze the way it looks and, like, what the hell is going on. Possibly. Trying to do that. I don't know if I'll succeed. Probably not. Here's another, like, okay, I said this is dusk. Okay, this is definitely nighttime. This is, like, I don't know. There's nobody on the street. So if this is New York City, like, where are the people? In New York City is supposed to be very, very crowded. Um... Hmm. <laughs> I mean, there's nobody on the street. There's these three people who are customers at this diner and and the guy like behind the counter, like, you know, serving people or making coffee or whatever. I don't know. Now, this is a dark kind of mysterious street. There's no people and there's no cars. So the modern age that is fueled by gasoline and electricity and natural gas and whatever else that those machines are not there those machines with wheels that make places like this gasoline station necessary they're not around at least not at this hour okay all right but these people are here why are they here this late these are the questions you have to ask when you see something like this they're here, and why is this place open this late? I guess I guess they had all night like diners and whatever, even as you know, even at a time like the 1940s, obviously, or you know, um, but there's not a lot of people. And this counter, this this lunch counter or whatever, um, it's a triangle, or it looks like a triangle to me. This is not rectangular. So this this guy, the guy who's working there in the white. He's surrounded on three sides by this muted red counter. Like, why? What's going on with this? Um, this look, the building itself looks kind of like an art deco thing going on. Lots of windows. You can see inside of it. It's kind of like a fishbowl. You know? It's kind of like a, or an aquarium, uh, what is it called? Like the thing, like the fish tank or the fishbowl or the aquarium where you keep your fish and you can just look at them all day long. If that's what you want to do, I I figure most people don't do that with fish, but whatever. Uh, you can see through this window, windows, 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 transparent. You can see whatever it is that's going on in this diner. Um, again, this doesn't make sense out here. The sidewalk, the empty sidewalk, the empty streets, the uh, the buildings across the street, no lights on. On the on the bottom floor, I guess these are shops nothing's going on in there, completely dark. And I assume that people live on the second floor. Nothing going on up there, too. All dark, except for this over here. Like, what the hell is this? I think somebody pointed something out to me, like this. It Was there, like, a ghostly kind of face in these windows? And if it is, is, is that, like, what is this? Well, he put that there. He, I mean, this is this is not an accident, in my opinion. He definitely, like deliberately put his put his brush down here in this window and and like just went Neh, with it and left this smudge in the darkness of this window what is that smudge is it a human face is it some kind of object that that's reflecting 
whatever little light is coming from this diner or a street lamp or whatever. Very, very, very weird. Very weird. Um, <clears throat> is there anything? Uh, let me look at the bottom floor of these shops. Oh, I don't know what kind of shop it is, but there's a cash register here and counters. And uh, Is it a dry cleaner? I don't know what's going on. And then there's this over here, and it's obscured by the glass between it and our perspective as the viewer. Okay, and then there's these people. I think I don't want to make an, I don't want to make a mistake, but like I think this might even have been his wife, who posed for the uh, the female figure in this painting. Okay, notice something. This is a diner. You go to a diner to eat, usually. You, that's a place where they serve food. Okay, where is it? Where's the food? Where's the food? We got coffee cups. All three of the pe customers here, yeah, they all have a cup of coffee in front of them. This man, he's smoking. Okay, but so where's the ashtray? Mm. Okay, never mind. The lady, she's got something in her hands. What is that? Is that a dollar, dollar bill? Is that a matchbook? I don't know. It looks a little too big to be a matchbook, but then again, I don't know what they had going on in the 1940s. And again, she's wearing red. And look at their faces. Look at these hollowed-out eyes. These people look sleep-deprived. Okay, is he... Oh, shit. Hold on. Sorry about that. So, I told you he's borrowing from the Baroque with the splashes of red. At least it looks like that to me, at least in these paintings that we're looking at. You know. Okay. Um, what else is he borrowing from? What else is going on here? You know, I, th I think he's definitely borrowing from the Baroque. Um, he's also, oh Lord, hold on, let me find it again. I saw something about their faces that made me like do a double take. And now I'm like wondering what it is that I saw. Hold on. <sighs> something about this is terrifying. The hollowed out eyes, they look. Okay, sorry, I had to take a little break an impromptu break. But what I was saying is the 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 way these people look. Let me let me zoom out. Um Oh, there's his signature. Look at it. It's very faint. But it's there. Edward Hopper. I'll show it to you because I think that's fascinating where he decided to sign his painting and how. Um <clears throat> There. Very, very interesting. But, like I said, he's he's referencing the Baroque. He might even be referencing, again, the Renaissance with um, just the appearance of this building. It looks short. The building looks short. The people in it look small compared to the height of the ceiling. Like, what is going on with this thing? This doesn't conform to, like, actual spatial, um, you know, realities of, of the actual real world. Like, what in the world is going on here? Why is the ceiling so tall? I mean, I, I guess the average height for a man is about six feet tall. And I know these guys are sitting down, and so is this lady. But... Mmm... If they got up, they wouldn't be that much taller because these are stools. Yeah. Why is the ceiling so high up? Really, really, really weird. And I, like I said, he's referencing the Baroque with like his use of red, at least in these three that I've chosen to talk about today. And then I zoomed into these faces and I saw something that just like made me stop for a second. These people look awfully... <laughs> I, I don't know. Is there a polite way to say it? They look dead. 
Their eyes are way too sunken in. This guy over here, we can't even see his face. Um, and like, what is he? Like, where is, why is this counter so narrow? Like, look at, look at the narrowness of this, um, lunch counter. Like, the only thing that can fit on here is like, you know, a cup of coffee comfortably. Like, it doesn't look like the, the width of the counter could take, like, a full-sized plate of food. Like, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Um, the stools don't wrap around the counter, but... What is going on here? This is very odd. This is very odd. Again, we can't even see this man's face. And these people are here late at night. Probably not for a good reason, either. Like, are these gangsters? Is this like a mob mall? Um, their, their eyes are way too sunken in. This, they look dead. They look dead. Is, are they borrowing from... Or are they, not they, but is Edward Hopper borrowing from... I don't know. Like, maybe Pablo Picasso and a lot of his... Uh, painting like the the man the blind man playing a guitar like that painting the, that man's eyes that's what this reminds me of again this lady's wearing red her hair is red I mean you know what let me just go ahead and put it out there is this really a lady and that's all I'm gonna say you know Yes, I, I don't know. And she's holding something in her hand. Is that money? Is it a matchbook? I have no idea. He's smoking. This man is smoking. Where's the ashtray? This There's a lot of things in here that don't make sense. There's a lot of things in this painting that just don't make no sense. So the predominant colors here are green and red. He's almost exclusively... Um, using those colors, at least from, you know, I'm sure he's mixing other colors in there. This isn't like, like the counter itself isn't a bright red, but it, I mean, there's not, no, it's red. It's red, but it's, like I said, a muted red, mu uh, red with like brown mixed into it, but it's still very obviously red. The building is red. The street, I'm uh, not, not red, green, excuse me. The building is green. The sidewalk, the streets are green. The building across the street, the lower floor is green. The top floor is red. The blinds, or the, you know, you pull down the shades on the window. Those shades are green, all of them. What's going on? And then on the um, marquee, I guess, of this building, it says Phillies. Okay. And then there's a cigar, and it says only five cents underneath it. Why is that cigar there? I know that they say sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. But, like, why is it there? He put it there. He could have put anything else there. He could have, you know, put a cup of coffee, since this is a diner. I didn't know you could buy cigars at diners, but, you know, what do I, what do I know? I wasn't alive in 1942. Like, what is going on? And then the inside of this building... <clears throat> through the window, this diner. It's obviously lit, yeah, and it's very bright light inside of the building. And it's not just very bright light, it's very harsh light. It's that unforgiving light that shows every line in your face, all of the stuff that you, like, maybe don't want people to focus on when they look at you. In this kind of light, you can't get away from it. You can't hide. Anything about yourself in this kind of light? Is this fluorescent light? Ay, 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 ay. And yeah, there's a very harsh light on the inside of this diner. But where is it coming from? What is the source of the light inside of this diner? Where are the light bulbs? Where are the light fixtures? Where are the lamps? Like, was fluorescent light, lighting even a thing in 1942? I don't know what to think. I really, really, really don't know what to think about this. Um, it's a mysterious light. It's very harsh 
light, but the, the mystery comes from the fact that we're, that, that we can't locate the source of the light just by looking at the painting. What the hell is going on here? What did Edward Hopper do in this painting? This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. And, and like I said, mysterious, spooky. Like, what is going on? What is going on? <sighs> I'm so glad I decided to make this video today because I always liked this painting. I, um, I was, I've always been intrigued by it as many people have. It's a famous painting for a reason. You know, there is hype, but there is also like this, this really something interesting going on here. What is that? What is Edward, Ed, Edward trying to say here? Uh, the interpretations of this painting are that, oh, it's about alienation in the modern world. Okay, sure. You know. All right. That's a nice, easy, neat explanation or interpretation or whatever you want to call it. And you, you know, you should know by now if you've, been, if you've been with me for however long. You should know that I don't do easy. I don't do uncomplicated. I I like to think. I like to think maybe a little too much. Uh, where is the light coming from? And again, he's borrowing from uh, maybe not so much the Renaissance, or not borrowing, referencing. Maybe not so much the re Renaissance, but the Baroque here, because the Baroque, there are many paintings. Go ahead and look at them. If I had planned this video better, I would have had this lined up for you. But there are plenty of Baroque paintings where the source of light um, is unidentified. It's mysterious. You don't know where the light is coming from. It shouldn't be there. Um, one good artist to uh, look up with regard to that is Caravaggio. Check him out. And Ed Caravaggio... He kind of sits right on the border between, as far as, mm, like, I think the, the official, like, word on him, he sits right on the border between the Renaissance and the Baroque, but I think he officially, like, belongs to the Baroque, um, and he does a lot of these mysterious light sources, and so does Tintoretto, so a lot of these artists do that. And here's Edward Hopper doing that and this isn't like a religious scene and one you know baroque renaissance just about all of the art was religious and that mysterious and or unidentified or untraceable source of light in the painting had to do with you know religion and um of course like the source of light you can't locate it in the painting but it's interpreted as 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 being divine is this divine in the Nighthawks? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, or maybe it is. I don't know what was on Hopper's mind when he was doing this. What in the world is going on? And even though it's nighttime, you know, there are shadows. And the shadows are created by artificial light. And by the way, where are the street lights on this street? Like we don't, if they're there, he's cho he's he's decided not to show them to us, the viewer. Yeah, we see the light coming from this diner, very bright, very mysterious, um, unidentifiable light. Like the source of it is, we we can't find it, at least not from what I I can see here. Um, and this light emanating from this diner seems to create the shadows around the diner. Okay. And the light coming from the diner, is that creating the light on the building across the street? Okay, all right. And then where are the shadows coming from? And other parts of the street, like where's the other source of light external to this diner? Where is that coming from? So many questions. And like I said, where's the food? Where's the food? That's maybe what I was going to say. Um, you know. These people look like living corpses when you zoom in on their faces. And it's like, it's a diner. You go to a diner to eat, but where's the food? There's no food. And like with this counter that is closest to us, 
like there's not enough room for a plate like what's going on um another place where like the 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 another painting rather very famous one where the subject matter of the painting allegedly has to do with food but there is no food anywhere to be seen really in the is the last supper by leonardo da vinci like there's no food on that table in the last supper and the interpretation in the last supper is oh you know there's no food on the table because they just got done eating okay sure <laughs> no like the food um jesus is the food <laughs> in the last supper the last supper is him he's 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 the one who's being served like is that what's going on here in this painting I don't know. I just don't know. I could do this forever, by the way. I'm sure there are things that I will notice later that I am not noticing now because my brain is tired. Oh, and then there's this door. Oh, Lord. Hold on. Wait a minute. We got to look at, look at the door. Look at this door. Is this the door to the kitchen? Is that the door to the bathroom? Like, what is this door? It's a mysterious door. It's got a little window on it, or that looks like a window. I assume it's a window. It doesn't have a doorknob, so it's probably one of those doors that you push and then they swing back and forth. Okay. All right. Hmm. Where does that door lead to? More mystery. More intrigue. More, like, weirdness. Whew. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Red. Red, 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 red. I didn't, I didn't, I never realized before I really took a close look at these how much he was borrowing from old art traditions and um, conventions and whatever. These people are, they seem very big too. Like the woman, the man over here, and the man over here, and the... Um, I'm the waiter or soda jerk or whatever he is if he's a soda jerk like okay cool that's what he like the stuff that i read this this figure in white he's interpreted as a soda jerk where's the soda where's the soda fountain if this he's he's dressed like a typical soda jerk of that time period okay great no problem all right where's the soda fountain I can't see it. We have two kettles back here. I assume those are for coffee or hot water. All right. Whatever. Okay. Like I said, I could keep going and going and going and going with this forever. I think I've said enough. I think I've ruined you enough for one, um, you know, episode or sitting. Um, I think I'm done. I've, I've run out of things to say. I've, I've run out of thoughts. I've, I mean, I, I'm sure I could do better but I can't right now. You guys, I want you, if you've listened to this, if you've watched this, whatever, and you have your own thoughts, your own ideas about Edward Hopper, about this kind of art in general, about anything, about the stuff I've said, if you think I'm wrong about something, if you can identify, for example, uh, or trace the source of light inside of this diner in this painting, let me know. Drop it in the comments. Um, or any other idea or thought you might have or, or you know, comments, statements, uh, criticism, complaints. Go ahead, do it. Write in the comments. Um, other than that, I think I'm pretty much done. So I hope you've enjoyed this foray into an art historical examination of one artist and like one little selection of paintings um, that I that are my favorites of, of his. Right. So once again, if you have any, uh, anything to say, please let me know. And until next time, I want to do this again. I want to pick another artist next time and do this all over again. Um, and maybe if you have a suggestion, let me know. Once again, in the comments, let me know if there's an artist that you want me to cover or research or talk about or what have you. And I will consider doing it. I might, I might very well do it. So that's it for now. Again, uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share if you're enjoying any of this uh, or if you know somebody who would enjoy it. And that's about it. Until next time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and bid you bye-bye. So, 
Bye-bye, everybody.